Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. The topic for today's video will be on sleep cycles and naps. Now, I'll be the first one to admit that we may have done a dum-dum. It would probably have been beneficial to upload this video uh, before the one talking about how to name sleep schedules, uh, but we'll put an i-card in that video to this one so new people can watch this video before that one. Anyways, in the last video titled the important sleep stages, uh, Yelta discussed what sleep stages are and which ones we have. And if you haven't watched that video, I highly suggest you watch it before this one, uh, because this video will be building upon that knowledge quite a bit. So, the length of each sleep session is specifically designed to accommodate a cyclical nature of sleep. What do I mean by cyclical nature of sleep? Uh, well, during the sleep, the body transitions between the different sleep stages as shown in this diagram. Assuming the sleeper isn't sleep deprived, uh, the first 25 to 27-ish minutes are typically spent in light sleep. Then the SWS stage begins after the body goes through uh, non-REM 2 and into the REM phase. When you are SWS deprived, SWS onset will be a bit faster than normal, and when severely SWS deprived, you will enter SWS only minutes after you fall asleep. If allowed to wake naturally, people will on average sleep for around five of these sleep cycles, for a total of just around under eight hours of sleep. In general, a sleep cycle is around 90 minutes, but sometimes they can be as long as 120 minutes or as short as 8 minutes, uh, depending on many factors including person-to-person -person changes. Cycle lengths also vary on a daily basis, so your first cycle might one day be 95 minutes and the next day 90 minutes. Uh, still, sleep cycles tend to average out to around the same sleep length each day. Every sleep cycle will theoretically contain some amount of SWS and REM each. However, due to influences of the circadian rhythm, uh, SWS is often more prevalent in the evening, while REM is more prevalent in the morning. But we'll talk more about that in future videos. Because of the easiness of waking up from light sleep, there are two ideal times to wake up during a sleep session. The first one is the first cycle's descent through light sleep before you enter SWS at around 25 minutes. 20 minute snaps take advantage of this window. Or two, right at the beginning of a new cycle during the light sleep phase. Core sleep scheduled in 90 minute cycles are generally safe lengths to enjoy these easier wake points for polyphasic sleep. These will both minimize sleep inertia while ensuring maximum alertness and productivity. Generally, the light sleep after a SWS block will still be a bit more difficult or unpleasant to wake from than light sleep after REM. But let's talk about cores and naps. Polyphasic sleep takes advantage of the aforementioned two ideal wake times by waking up at specific intervals from sleep. Cores are typically scheduled to be a multiple of 90 minutes on a polyphasic schedule. After multiple weeks, many polyphasic sleepers find themselves waking up earlier than expected for 90-minute cycles and can safely reset their alarms to reflect shorter sleep cycles. The core length till alarm matters because you definitely want to wake in light sleep every time because waking in an SWS block strongly increases the risk of falling back asleep or not waking up at all. Waking during a uh, REM is okay, uh, or may be desirable for dream recall, but it also carries some sleep inertia. Waking comfortably uh, during light sleep won't happen consistently during the adaptation process, but by definition it will once adapted after about four to six weeks. Core cycle lengths matter as you progress in adaptation. You should start with 90 minute cycles as a default, after some weeks, if you consistently begin waking early, uh, then you can assume that your sleep cycles have shortened and you can move your alarm times accordingly. Many polyphasic schedules have this effect. After they have shortened, you can move your alarm times earlier to reflect 
this change in length. It's also possible to increase uh, core length by around 30 minutes after the second or third cycle of the night. This will increase the ease of adaptation as well as allow for a greater day-to-day -day flexibility of sleep times after the adaptation is complete. The downside of this is, of course, spending a bit more time being asleep. Let's quickly go over naps a bit. If you want more information on this topic, you can check out our video about naps. Uh, nap should be 20 minutes long, but you can set your alarms for about 22 minutes to account for the time it takes to fall asleep. Naps longer than 25 minutes have an increased chance of reaching the SWS stage, uh, during which waking up becomes hard and most people wake up groggy. During adaptation, SQS might be prone to uh, creeping in earlier to making 20 minutes the safest productive lengths. Adaptation to napping has occurred when most of your naps had take advantage of sleep onset REM or SOREM for shorts. This is an emergency REM preservation feature of the brain uh, witnessed most clearly in narcoleptic patients uh, but can be triggered by healthy individuals too in reduced sleep polyphasic schedules. After just a couple of minutes of light sleep required to transition from waking, uh, you will fall into REM sleep for up around 15 minutes. Until later in the adaptation process, your naps will consist of light sleep, uh, which will be mildly refreshing, but REM pressure will steadily build and you will feel sleep deprived when the light sleep wakefulness fades. Naps are not recommended in the evening or night. After about 14 or 15, the circadian REM pressure becomes low and the SWS pressure steadily increases towards the 9 p.m. to midnight SWS peak. Um, in the evening and night, naps contain mostly SWS after just several minutes. The latest SWS-free naps that seem to work consistently are around 17 or 18 at latest, based on anecdotal reports online. Uh, but SWS can occur earlier too, so don't try to push your luck too far here. Morning naps during graveyard hours are more likely to contain SWS unless all SWS need has been taken care of by the core, and REM-containing naps will be more likely as you progress towards the REM peak at around 06 to 09. Um, around noon, naps can predominantly contain both NREM2 and REM or only NREM2, depending on the sleep pressure of the schedule. By the way, longer 90-minute siestas around noon will typically contain both SWS and REM. Anyways, that's all for today's video. I hope your knowledge on sleep architecture has expanded and that this video was interesting to you. See you in the next video. Nap well! Hey, thanks for making it this far. I want to take this time to shout out our coffee page. Donations go a long way with improving the knowledge of the community and helps us continue the upkeep of polyvasic.net. We plan on funding experiments and sleep trackers for members of the community in the future, and that in turn helps us make sure the scientific endeavors of polyphasic sleep are kept up. And if you like our content, we would really appreciate it if you click the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss out on any videos in the future. Also, if you'd like to chat with us, you can join our Discord. This is where most polyphasic sleep related discussions take place. The links will be in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you later.